Right, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this week's monthly webinar with myself, Michael Hewson, and my colleague in Canada, Colin Szynski. And this is generally our week, uh, not our weekly, our monthly um, sort of chat where we sort of dissect what's been going on in the markets and um, what to expect over the course of the next two to three weeks. Unfortunately, recent events have given us an awful lot to talk about um, with you guys, um, certainly an awful lot to dissect um, with respect to what to expect from central banks, what to expect from um, UK, US and European economic data, Japanese economic data. I'm just going to do a quick risk warning, try and quickly get that out of the way um, before we get started. And um, then we'll have a look at a quick outlook, um, which Colin has kindly sort of drawn up, where we'll discuss the outlook for this year. And certainly, I think if um, I think if the first 15 days of this year have been any guide, I think it's going to be a roller coaster ride. Um, Philadelphia Fed has missed by a country mile. It's coming at 6.3. Expectations were for 18.7. So Empire Manufacturing was slightly better than expected. Philadelphia Fed was significantly worse than expected. So try and take the bones out of that particular one. I think but, this is indicative of, of everything we've got going on th this year, Michael, in terms of that we're getting a lot of conflicting data, a lot of things are going in different directions, and, and there, there's a lot of uncertainty as, as we go through transition phases. And I think with, with the surprises we've seen today and, and just generally that uh, we're looking at, uh, I think we're looking at a year of a lot of volatility. Well, as I say, I mean, if the first two weeks have been any guide, then, um, you know, we're going to see... Um, quite a lot of volatility for the remainder of the year, which in a way is good, but in other ways it's very, very bad because it doesn't really give you any certainty as to the direction of the way markets are going. So to get started, let's start with um, our pariah of the day, and that's Mr. Thomas Jordan of the Swiss National Bank, who basically decided to pull the rug out from pretty much everyone in the markets today after insisting not less than probably a week ago, that uh, they remained committed to defending the peg or the cap in the Swiss franc. Uh, the Swiss bank, Swiss National Bank, came out this morning and basically pulled it, catching everyone the wrong way and uh, sending the Swiss franc to record highs in the space of about five minutes. And you can certainly see that on this one-hour chart here. I mean, it really makes... The rest of the data on this chart pretty much irrelevant. And, the, and I think the biggest question now, really, is where do we go? Where do we go from here? And to be quite honest, I think the, direc the direction is likely to be further Swiss gains. It's probably going to trade between 0.95 and 1.05. And I think cast your mind back four years ago when they first brought the cap in, we were trading around about parity then. Um, or just above parity, around about 103. Obviously, we've gone completely through that and beyond and hit a low of 0.85. And we need to have basically look at some of the reasons behind why the SNB felt compelled to pull the peg or pull the plug, depending on um, how you want to, to analyze it. And some of the reasons for the decision uh, I suppose eminently sensible, but I think it's the way it was done that's really rankling in the markets at the moment. No warning. Uh, and the fact is they've completely gone back on some of the statements they've made earlier this year. And that, for me, more than anything, is a very bad thing because it basically means that how can anyone in the market trust um, anything a central bank or a central banker says in the future. So let's talk about the reasons. Well, a large part of one of the, large, I think a large part of one of the reasons was the fact that Swiss, the Swiss franc was seeing an awful lot of inflows of Russian money um, because of the crisis in Russia. And, they, and it was costing the Swiss National Bank an awful lot more money just to defend the peg. Um, there was another reason, and I, think, I don't think you need to be a genius to figure out what that other reason is, and that was this week's um, this week's uh, announcement from the European Court of Justice that pretty much rubber-stamped 
a potential QE program from the European Central Bank. Um, the fact is that if the ECB has been given the green light, then I think it's quite likely that Mr. Draghi um, picked up one of his various mobile phones and decided to give Mr. Jordan a quick call and said, excuse me, Governor, but um, your peg. We're going to be launching a big QE program shortly, and to be quite honest, we're going to roll right over it. So you might as well just pull it and cut interest rates even deeper into negative territory. And I think that's what we're seeing here. I think Swiss National Bank has been given a, an ultimatum by the ECB saying they're, they're getting ready to do QE and that the peg, as we know it, is history. Why didn't the markets see this coming? I think really they believe the rhetoric from the Swiss National Bank. And now we are where we are. So essentially what does that mean? Well, I think it probably means gold goes up because, to my mind, it's not it's not behoven to central bankers' promises or lack thereof. Um, and as such, I think you know we could well see further Swiss strength because I think there is a determination or a race to the bottom in terms of countries want to weaken their currencies and everyone wants to do the same thing. Have you got anything else to add, Colin? Uh, yes, in, in particular, also the the rally in the gold, and I'll show it on the slide a little later on. That uh, of how the uh, one of the thing, main things that gold has been tracking over the last few years has been e uh, European money supply, and uh, both up and down from the ECB. And uh, and now with uh, with gold taking off, it looks like the uh, the, uh, the they're getting ready for a a big uh, increase in the ECB balance sheet again. And, and it's important to remember also, gold hasn't just taken off against U.S. dollar; it positively exploded. Breaking after breaking out over Euro 1000 last week, so gold is moving up against uh, against multiple currencies here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight, Michael, is we've got the DAX back up at 10,000 again. In fact, it's yeah. just trying to peak above it. So we're certainly seeing a uh, uh, an explosive move up again for uh, well every major European index except Switzerland, which has obviously gone the other gone 10 percent the other way. Well, that that sort of makes sense. And in, in the note that I put out this morning, um, I suggested that you know while the Swiss the Swiss market index is going to suffer because essentially Swiss exports are going to get that much more expensive. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't bought your lint Easter eggs yet, I suggest you go out and clear the shelves now because in about four or five weeks' time they're going to be a hell of a lot more expensive. But more than that, the euro, the euro is going to get a hell of a lot weaker, which is going to be particularly good for German companies, Spanish companies, and um, other, European, other, other European countries. And as I say, you can find that on the um, news and analysis section of the CMC Markets website. But more importantly than that, that gold breakout that we've seen on my daily chart here would seem to suggest that we're probably going to get a strong move higher over the course of the next few days and weeks. It's just about breaking above the 200-day moving average, and it's also broken above this triangular consolidation here. Now, one of the key things in terms of price targeting with respect to triangles is you basically take the base of the triangle, which is this distance between here, where my mouse is, and the base here, and you project it up from the breakout point. So that would seem to suggest if we close above the 200-day moving average and we don't come back within the triangle, then we're going to probably test this upper line here around about $1,300 an ounce. Irrespective of what you think about the direction of U.S. rates, which Colin and I will talk about quite shortly as well because we disagree on that. Don't we, young man? Uh, absolutely, but uh, I don't think the uh, the U.S. rates is going to have a huge in impact on gold. Anyways, I think this is a euro play this year. You for uh, okay. I think that uh, that the euro is going to be the big driver. Okay, so we've t we've talked about the Swiss franc. Obviously, this is a race to the bottom in terms of rates. You've got negative yields basically in all of the main or, or approaching negative yields in some of the short end of German bo German bonds, um, Japanese JGBs. And also, um, there's the likelihood that we could actually start to get those sorts of um, non-yields, if you like, in, uh, in uh, some of the uh, shorter-dated um, French debt as well, because that is, is also trading at record yields. Um, so, so let's, get, let's, 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 let's talk about your outlook, young man, because I think what, that's what we really need to talk about, and that's what we're here for. And in the context of that... Um, you can talk me through it. So we'll talk about the Forex trading outlook 
and we'll start with your first slide here. So off you go, and I'll chip in as and when you want me to. Thanks very much, Michael. So uh, there is a, uh, a few things I had looked at uh, that might impact Forex trading in, in 2015. And uh, number one, and it's one that I think really is going to work its way through global markets throughout the year, number one thing is followed from the crude oil price crash. What we've seen over the last week is a generational decline in crude oil that we last saw back in the mid-1980s. And this could have wide ramifications for a long time, and it's been driven by a price war, which makes me think that crude oil is going to stay down for a while, and it's going to take the, probably the better part of the year for people to figure out, A, what's happened, and B, how to deal with it. So in, in currency markets, this is the Canadian dollar, Norwegian krona, and, and the ruble, uh, plus it can have an impact on equity markets, and certainly we're seeing it on, on energy stocks as, as well. Uh, the second one, will the ECB get serious about monetary stimulus this year? Well, I think everything we've seen over the last week or so uh, running into today suggests that they, they finally are. And so what did I, I, I had here? Uh, this is a presentation I did last week, by the way, that we're, uh, we're continuing on with and, and broadening a bit. So gold, euro, Swiss, and, uh, and I had put the Swedish krona in there just in terms of that it can affect the, the other European currencies a, as well. Uh, the third one, could the Fed and Bank of England raise interest rates this year, and if so, when? That's a, uh, uh, one of those points where, uh, where Michael and I me. have beat both done a lot of uh, a lot of work on this and come up with very different conclusions so uh, so it's a uh, it, it's a good uh, it's a good one for uh, for debating uh, increased political and economic instability and defensive posturing gold yen and swiss well we're certainly seeing that uh, uh, play out today and then uh, uh, the other factor is, is china and the uh, the demand for commodities uh, we've been seeing a little bit of that uh, playing out in uh, in asia pacific trades this week off of the uh, the china trade numbers uh, aussie jobs and uh, and things like that. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Michael? Perfect. So how low can crude go and how long can it stay down? So I, I put up this slide here on, uh, on, on crude oil and, and, and some of the major declines in, uh, in recent years. And, and, and where I had done the date level broken was I had taken on a monthly close when crude oil fell 30% off its highs and, and some of the major price levels. So, for example, in, in January 86, it broke $25, and it didn't go back above it till August of 1990. It broke it again in January of 91 and didn't go back up till December of 96. So if you look there, that was a period where, except for five months during the, the when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, oil went under under $25 and stayed down it for almost 11 years. So that's huge. But even if you look at, uh, so, uh, and then some later ones, oil broke 20 and was under for two years, and then oil broke 30 in 2000 and stayed under for almost two years. So uh, even the more, uh, the more recent one uh, in 08, which was more of a V bottom for, uh, for crude oil, broke 100, was below it for 30 months, broke 80, was below that for 18 months. And, and even more recently, the previous time oil had broken $100 in May of 12, was down for 15 months. So you're talking about a decline. That uh, that likely um, the hundred dollars we may not see for for five years or more, and and eighty we may not see for two or three years easily uh, in the context of previous uh, decline. So so what are we seeing in this? Uh, a number of factors are, are starting to happen. Number one, I was uh, reading an article on uh, on Bloomberg this morning talking about layoffs in the oil patch, and, and keep an eye out on Schlumberger earnings tonight after the U.S. markets close because the first thing that usually happens, drilling activity slows and. And, uh, and the producers put the squeeze on the uh, on the service companies. So we'll be uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that today. That's the first impact. Uh, in the longer term, you do get a positive impact in, on on other areas, and you get a, a rebalancing uh, into other sectors, particularly consumer spending. Last night I went out and uh, and uh, put gas in my car, and it was just under thirty dollars. And, and a few months ago, it was more like fifty. So it is a uh, it is a big difference, but it takes a while for people to to figure this out and to re figure out the impact that. No, it isn't just down for two months and it's going right back up. It's down to stay and, and to change their behavior can take a little bit of time. But, uh, but overall, this is a big story that certainly is going to uh, impact uh, a lot of countries, a lot of economies, a lot of currencies is, is a rebalancing of, of what happens when, uh, with, when, in, in a new lower price uh, crude environment. And, and, and it's interesting, too, with, with Japan and with, with uh, Europe, uh, areas that are more uh, particularly more um, 
uh, oil importing than, uh, than, than perhaps other areas. Um, on top of the stimulus programs that are coming, this is huge. I mean, this is a, uh, a major raise for people. And on top of that, in some ways, it's even better than QE because it's money that's directly going into people's pockets, not just uh, going to the banks and we hope it trickles through. This is, this is you know, hard cash going into people's pockets. Which sort of supports my argument that rates are likely to remain lower for longer, not the other way around. Because Interest rates, no, I think, are going to go there a, a little different way, at least in the States, but we no can talk inflation. about that a little after. But you go ahead, Michael. Did you want to add anything here? No, no. I mean, basically what I was saying is, you know, you, you basically made the argument that oil prices are going to stay lower for longer. Usually there's a lag effect with respect to oil prices. If you look at where crude oil was in, say, 2008, where it bottomed out, it bottomed out at around about $35 a barrel on Brent, $36. Mm -hmm. Inflation here in the U.K., um, went from 4%, 4.5% in December 2008 to 1.1% in September 2009, and then it started to go up again. So essentially what, ha what I'm saying is that inflation took 10 months before it started to edge higher, and that was after the oil price basically bottomed out. Now, you're saying, uh, in your view, is that oil prices have got further to go. So that suggests to me that if that is the case, and then there's a nine-month lag time on crude prices, then the likelihood is inflation expectations are likely to remain well below 2% well into the end of this year and possibly into the beginning of next year, which sort of suggests to me that we're not going to see a rate hike, firstly, here in the UK, this side of the election, or um, the end of this year either, but also um, in the US as well, especially given the fact that we saw a very, very poor U.S. retail sales number um, yesterday, and pretty much the, that December figure wiped out the entire gains for Q4. So basically, U.S. retail sales, despite the fact that consumer confidence is at record highs, were flat for the fourth quarter. They were worse than the Q1 um, when they had the polar vortex. So that suggests to me that the U.S. consumer, despite what people are saying, is saving money or reluctant to spend it, despite the fact that since September we've seen a net fall in oil prices of around about 30%. Gas prices have dropped from around about $3 a gallon to around about $2 a gallon, yet consumers aren't spending it. So for me, that makes it much less likely that the Fed is going to raise rates and risk tipping the economy or slowing the economy down. That's, that's my argument for basically saying that U.S. rates are unlikely to rise. And furthermore, if the Fed doesn't want a stronger dollar, the last thing it wants to do when everyone else is cutting like mad is to start nudging rates higher because there will be an export effect in terms of the strength of the dollar on the S&P 500 companies. And given the fact that about 40% of the S&P 500 do have an energy exposure, that's going to be a factor as well. That's me yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great case here that you're making, and, and certainly I think there's a lot more uh, uh, ramifications of, uh, of, of crude oil, and, and it's a, point you, a good point you made also about the, the companies, uh, the S&P companies, that, uh, that we've already had this big increase in, in the U.S. dollar, and something to watch for as we go through Q1 earnings season is what is this going to do for, uh, for guidance going forward? Uh, an interesting one, Target decided to woke up this morning and has decided to pull out of Canada completely. They had come in with 100 stores less than two years ago, and they've just pulled the plug on it. They weren't doing that. They were struggling as it was. But, uh, but what's going to happen to uh, overseas operations of, uh, of U.S. companies where all of a sudden the U.S. dollar's gone up and, uh, and those earnings are coming back in at, uh, at lower levels? And what's that going to do for guidance? That's something I'm keeping an eye of on, uh, in particular, this, uh, this quarter. The... Um, so I thought we'd with, uh, with that, by the way, and how low could crude go? I agree with you, Michael. I think we're going to retest the 2008 lows uh, at least. For the, for the short term, it looks like it's trying to find a floor here somewhere in the 45 to 50 area, but mm. uh, just from the talk we've gotten and, and the previous low, I, I don't see how we're going to get through this year without retesting that. So let's okay. go on to the next one. ECB balance sheet and the gold price. So we had touched on this one a, a little bit earlier, but I wanted to highlight in, in particular the, the blue line, which was the ECB, and the green line, which is gold, or well, the two lines at the bottom, which are the gold price. Golden dollars is the green, and uh, golden euros is the purple. 
and uh, I had done this a couple of weeks ago, so I don't have the breakout on there of gold euro, but it has actually gone back above the uh, the 1,000 in the in the last in the last week or so. So, uh, but if we want you here, and the, the important thing is, if we look at the trend. Historically, most people have thought that the uh, that gold trades against the against the U.S. dollar. That uh, the gold is a premier hard asset, U.S. dollar is a premier paper asset, and they basically oppose each other. One goes up and the other goes down. But if you look here over the last few years, the Fed balance sheet has exploded. And the first couple of years, sure, it followed everybody's balance sheet higher. But the last two years, when the ECB started running down their balance sheet through uh, what I called the, the stealth taper, which was every week these banks were repaying their loans, that uh, that the uh, the the ECB balance sheet came down a trillion euros and gold came down. And uh, and now that the ECB has been talking more seriously about rebuilding and putting that trillion euros back on the balance sheet, gold had stabilized and had started to pick up. And then over the last week or so, there was there was a, a Friday when the, the trial balloon went up on a 500 billion euro uh, QE program and, and the, the ECG... Um, the justice decision earlier this week, and now this morning with the with the SNB, everything's pointing to a massive QE coming, serious QE coming from from the ECB. And I had called it their their credibility problem because they had been talking about quantitative easing since May, and and really hadn't done a heck of a lot. And through much of that, the uh, the ECB balance sheet had actually shrunk. But it looks like they're finally getting serious, and most people are coming around to that. So I said, you know, at this point, that they better get serious. But I, certainly the SNB. Uh, move today suggests that they are. Yeah, it does, but also it could just be a ploy to help drive the euro lower. Um I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't bank on the ECB going shock and all because for me there are still significant legal hurdles within Germany for a full blown quantitative easing program. And I think if Mr Draghi tries to steamroller through a large program uh, you just watch the lawsuits come in the European Court of Justice is essentially ra ridden roughshod over the uh, German Constitutional Court and that, that ruling this week is non-binding um, so the court hasn't actually made its final decision so I think there also may be a little bit of kidology going on here with respect to the central bank so there's still scope for the ECB to disappoint next week they may announce something without actually doing anything. So be very, very cautious about having significant positions around that particular meeting because expectations now are so high that it's going to take something really substantial for um, the markets not to be disappointed by any announcement next week. I agree with you, Michael. I think we, we could see if they don't come in now with, with what's getting priced in, whether it's been priced into the Swiss, priced into the Euro, priced into the DAX, if they come in short of, of what are now extremely high expectations, you could have some pretty major reversals next week. So uh, that's going to be a really uh, a real crucible for, uh, for uh, a lot of markets. Okay, before we go into... There we, we go, ECB's credibility problem. Problem, yeah. yeah. We've talked about that, and you can see the uh, the shrinking balance sheet, the incredible shrinking balance sheet. Yeah. Um, okay, let's just quickly have a look at some of the charts. Are there any particular charts you want to have a quick look at? Because one of the things that I actually found quite interesting about um, uh, is the divergence between cable and euro dollar. Uh, we talked to this. Sure, let's take a look at that. Because euro, um, or sorry, um, euro pound has gone through the floor. So yeah, yeah let's take a look at this. I mean, we looked at the twin lows around 117.50. We're way through that now, you know, and, and a lot. And I think that this is borne out much more. This is much better by this particular chart here, the four-hour chart. So we've broken out on on euro dollar. So at the moment, for me, I think any pullbacks to around about 117.50, which is essentially where the euro was actually first launched, there or thereabouts is probably going to find a significant amount of resistance. And up until quite recently, the pound was actually trading in a, in a fairly similar fashion in the context of uh, after making its lows fairly recently, uh, around about 150.35. And we're still trading in a little bit of an uptrend with a significant cap round about um, you know, sort of 152.80, 152.70, but we are in a little bit of an uptrend. So the pound is actually benefiting um, to um, as a result of the weakness that we're seeing in euro sterling. 
but I would also be a little bit cautious about being um, overly long the pound in the lead up to a general election because cast your mind back to 2010. Um, in 2009, cable peaked at around about 171, August 2009, and by the time of the May election, it was around about 142. When did the cable peak last year? It peaked at around 171 in the summer of 2014. We now have another May election in 2015, and there's a very, very good chance, I think, that you know, the political uncertainty could undermine sentiment towards the pound, and we could see a return towards 142 over the course of the next two to three months. It really depends, and I think a lot of it is down to political uncertainty, but it's also about US rate expectations as well. So I think the pound is a little bit harder to call because I think the market is pretty much geared for a US rate rise at the moment that we may or may not get. At the moment, I'm of the opinion that we probably won't get it um, this year. Colin seems to think maybe June or potentially in November. But at the moment, if you're positioned for a rate rise and the data continues to disappoint, the likelihood is that that rate rise will get put off. And the FOMC committee, um, which is due to meet at the end of this month, yes. has, has a whole host of new voting members, well, actually four new voting members um, from the, last, the four last year. And the two most hawkish members of that committee no longer have a vote this year. And as such, the committee, I think, is going to be slightly more dovish in terms of its outlook and the context of when it's going to be safe to nudge rate expectations upwards. Mm -hmm. Can I mention something on the pound, Michael, or on sure. Bank of England? So, yeah. so my thinking on Bank of England is, is twofold. Whenever they do get around to raising interest rates, I think they'll probably do two increases and then stop, which is what he did in Canada a few years back, basically get it up to 1% and stop there and, uh, and get the lay of the land. And, and flatly, we've been sitting at 1% at ever since for like over four years now. The, um, the other thing is on, on, on when the UK might act, um, certainly the, definitely not before the summer, definitely not before the election. And, and flatly, I think definitely not before the Fed. I think they're going to wait until the Fed gives them cover to do it. So yeah. Yeah, if the Fed, if the Fed uh, goes uh, delays, then certainly I think you'd see the same from the, uh, from the Bank of England, for sure. There's one, there's one other factor. I think the likelihood is we're going to see negative inflation between now and the summer, mm -hmm. given the declines that we've seen in the oil price. The headline rate currently is at 0.5%. It's below the core rate, which is one3 so um, the, the last time the headline rate was below the core rate was, guess, 2009, when Brent crude prices were last at these, these sorts of levels. So on the basis that there's a nine-month lag, the likelihood is that CPI inflation is likely to go into negative territory in the next five or six months, which means that unless you get a significant pickup in wage growth, and wage growth at the moment is around about 1.4% on a three-month basis, then it's very unlikely that the Bank of England is going to start raising rates because it has an inflation target of 2%, and that 2% we're miles away from it. So if anything, if it, needs to, if it needs to hit its inflation target, it needs to cut rates. It needs to do further stimulus. So I think people talk about rate, rate, rate hikes. We're way, it's, way, it's way too premature for that. We're getting a good deflation because fuel prices are lower and food prices are lower. And while that remains the case, I think rate, I think, um, rate hikes are most definitely off the table. And the same applies to the U.S., really, the same rationale. Um, yeah, they're and getting and the same type of deflation. So I've got a question for you, Michael. How yeah. big of the U.K. economy is the oil and gas sector? It's a very, very small part of the U.K. Okay. economy. It makes up around about 8 or 9%. Slightly more in the Scottish economy, mm -hmm. but as far as the UK economy, construction makes up about six or seven percent, manufacturing twelve percent, services around about eight, you know eighty percent. Right. Okay. So Could... we're in, we are a net oil importer, which essentially means that whenever there's an oil price rise or fall, we generally tend to feel the effects in terms of the inflation rate because when when oil prices went up to one hundred and forty-five dollars a barrel. In 2010, the inflation rate hit five and a half percent, and it stayed there for a while. And it stayed there for a while, and the Bank of England looks through it. 
So, you know, the Bank of England can't say that, you know, we need to ignore seasonality factors and transitory factors. On the one hand, when, oil, when, when inflation is high, they can't then turn around and ignore it when inflation is low. Well, they can, but then they lose credibility like the Swiss National Bank's just done this morning. Because mm -hmm. so where, where I think one of the places I, I think you and I differ on our, are differing on our opinions is that um, I think the central banks are more focused on core inflation. And, uh, and I go back and I think to 2008 when uh, oil prices on, and WTI was going up to $147 uh, at a time that the Fed was actually cutting rates. And they, they kind of looked through that. And I think the, the cent my feeling is that the central banks, in terms of the big swings up and the big swings down in energy prices, I think they look through it. But what I, what I, where I do agree with you in part is that what we've got to watch for with this one is the impact on employment because I was looking at – um, U.S. Uh, jobless claims starting to peak up today and back above 300,000 and articles about big layoffs in the oil and gas sector. And that's an area where I do think you could see a, a delay. So um, perhaps can we go back to the slides and we'll go back to the last one. I can talk about the, the Fed scenarios. Sure, we can. No problem. There we go. Okay, so two more. Yeah. And one more. One more. Okay. So, um, so going back to a couple of weeks ago, this is what I had outlined for a, a Fed rate hike, rate hike program. And, and what I did was, uh, if you look at the little table at the bottom, I took the, uh, did the connecting the dots, and I took the uh, where the Fed members had had their forecasts for interest rates for the end of 2015 that they published after their December. Uh, 2014 meeting. So of that, you had two basically saying no change. I think we knew who they are. They were Coach Lakota and Evans. Uh, Evans is voting this year. Coach Lakota dropped off, so they kind of offset each other as the most dovish uh, uh, outliers. And, and if you did see something, the the dovish dissenter. The uh, most of the group was in and around 0.75 to one and a quarter percent. There was nine members, and then there were six members that were a little more hawkish, all kind of saying in between one and a half to two percent. So I put together three scenarios, and I said, okay, well, what would this actually, what could this actually look like, as a, as an example? So uh, scenario one was the the hawkish aggressive, uh, which said uh, in, you started uh, two other things in uh, in the Fed minutes when they talked about being patient, the, the and, and Fed Chair Yellen came along and subsequently said, well, we mean a couple of meetings, and when they asked her what does a couple mean, she said, well, we mean two. And the other thing she said was that the Fed would be prepared to move, not just at meetings where they have press conferences, but at any meeting. So I said, okay, fine. Uh, well, if that's the case, then we, we run a scenario where the first two meetings of the year, uh, the Fed does nothing, which is basically what they said. So hawkish scenario number one would be, okay, fine, what if they do a quarter point increase every meeting starting in April. That gets you to 1.75%, which puts you in with those six, uh, six more hawkish members. Given the data that we've had between the, uh, the employment, uh, between the employment, the retail sales, and, and, and other things, I think that scenario now is pretty much off the table. I think we can forget about that one. Scenario two was a more middle-of-the-road uh, scenario where I said, okay, fine, well, the Fed starts in June, which is what most people have been thinking for a while, and they do one increase in interest rate increase every other meeting. So they raise in June, September, and December, and that gets them to 1%, which puts them kind of in the middle with that group of nine as to where everybody's been forecasting. And then the third scenario was the late start where perhaps they, they hold off a little bit and then be more aggressive, where they start raising rates in July and then go up quarter point every meeting. Um, even Evans, when he was talking uh, more recently on, from the Dovich side, said, I don't want to raise rates at all this year, but if I do, if we do do it, we, I, want to, I want us to go slow. So that kind of still points towards some variation on, on scenario two, where though they may, they may do a short increase and then um, – and then go from there, but you know every you know an increase and then pause and make sure it hasn't crashed anything and then go again kind of uh, of scenario because uh, my feeling is that if you if you focus if you look at core rates that uh, that they're still well behind the curve you've got a uh, the the interest rate that the Fed uses is is called the PCE core rate it comes out when uh, when the with the personal spending and personal consumption data and it was read at in December was at 1.4 percent a little softer than the street which another thing that says that they're not under pressure to move right away but uh, even if you looked we scroll down and I'm just looking at today's producer price numbers was that if we went ex-food and energy, 
that uh, so final demand for producer prices was 1.1 percent, just above 1.0 uh, for the street. X food and energy was 2.1 percent. So there are still some inflation pressures out there. There's enough that if the U.S. economy remains strong. There's a case for them to just, if you go to 1% you're on, in either country, you're still stimulative, you're still running below uh, below core inflation. Whereas if you, uh, so the one I think the trigger would be, the could be the employment thing for a delay. If we do see um, job growth start to slow, jobless claims pick up because people are getting laid off in the oil and gas sector because the, the, it's fat, that comes first. The, the cuts in the oil price sector come first. The benefits of the lower gas price, or, or here in Canada, the lower Canadian dollar from the uh, from the, the crash in oil prices. Those benefits in other sectors take longer to work their way into the system. So you, you're, that's one of these reasons I say we're in a, a transition phase in uh, in economies. So uh, if we do see the Fed go later, then uh, then uh, that it would probably I suspect it'd be more on the employment side. No, I know, I know the Fed has a dual mandate, Colin, for employment and inflation, but with wage growth sinking back, irrespective of what inflation does, I hardly think they're going to raise rates. Yeah, I still think they might do it just because eventually, eventually they have to, and, and the other part of oh, which uh, yeah. is that, uh, but they, that they, if you yeah. look at the – the oil price crashes, and, and, and what I wanted, I, another thing was with the stock market. Historically, oil price crashes have ignited the stock market. I don't have a slide for that, but they, right. if you look at 80, early 86, you then had a massive rally in the stock market, and, uh, and, uh, and similarly in, in 98, you had an oil price crash and a, and a Russian crisis, and it sounds kind of familiar to now. Yeah. And uh, again, and then in 99, you had a massive rally in the stock market. So that's uh, another thing to, to keep an eye on. In, in time, it does ignite, and, and even in, uh, in 2003, uh, after the second Gulf War, you had a big drop in oil prices, uh, ignited the stock market, and eventually ignited the economy. So it's a key, and that was, it was after that one where the, the Feds did start, actually start to, uh, start to raise interest rates. So that's not a, that's a reasonable conclusion. But yeah, I mean, maybe it gets delayed to, to later in the year mm. from mid-year, but I, I can't rule out completely that they'll start to do it at some point, or they will, they run the risk of really getting getting behind the curve because I mean the, I'm, you know I'm, I'm calling it because I think that that's mm -hmm. you know that's a distinct possibility and you said that they eventually have to raise rates well actually they don't because the Japanese haven't raised rates for 20 years so you know just because you know yeah. you know there we you know really depends on whether or not you think the world is into a cycle of deflation and and if it is and the likelihood is it could well be given what's coming out of China at the moment um, and what Europe is also exporting in terms of deflation to countries like Switzerland, there's no, there's, there's no guarantee that um, the U.S. won't also be similarly afflicted by the fact that you've got all this deflation um, coming, coming out from countries like um, um, Germany and, um, and um, Japan and China. You know, yeah, so I, I mean, you know, that 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 is that is that's what that's what's making me a little bit concerned. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gents, is there anything in particular you would like Colin and I to look at for you, in the context of what we've been talking about? Obviously, we're seeing, looking at the moment, the Swiss market index has dropped quite sharply today, um, basically given up um, pretty much all of its gains for the last three months. Um, conversely, the DAX has motored ahead. Um, but um, is there something also that you'd like me to look at, Colin, in terms of dollar CAD or um, the TSX 60 or something like that? Because we've done a lot of talking, but we actually haven't done an awful lot of analysis. And I'm sure the people who are listening would actually like us to actually look at um, some of some of the currencies and do a little bit of analysis. Sure, Are let's they... bring up dollar CAD because that's been interesting lately. The, okay. um, I know what you're saying about about Japan, although they've also had deflation for a long time, and and even oil prices have go up for a long time and stay down for a long time, and even within these kind of larger larger trends, it's a. Uh, it, it, Interest rates and inflation do go up and do go down depending on how the economies work. I guess the the, the um, disagreement uh, or we have or I guess is a the difference uh, of opinion. A so. of time, difference of opinion <laughs> is is on, is really on is on timing. I, I do think that uh, that we will get uh, at least a moderate rate hike. I don't think we'll stay at uh, at point two five forever, but uh, mm. at the same time, I don't see the the Fed going much past one percent. 
uh, mm-hmm. either. And I do think those farther those farther out uh, forecasts where they were looking at, at three and four percent a couple of years down the road, those I think are going to come down. But I do feel that my feeling is probably that they'll at least try and do start to do something, and and mm-hmm. the, the, probably more like a uh, the the scenario of what Canada did, where they went to one percent and just sat there. Sure. I just don't think the bond markets are pricing in it at the moment. If you look at the 10-year Treasury, um, mm-hmm. it's around 1.8 percent. You know, and it's um, you know it's, it's the lowest it's been since I think yeah. um, you know when um, we had the. Um, when Mr. Bernanke first announced the fact that uh, he was going to start tapering, because uh, I think that was around about 2012, when U.S. Treasuries were around about 1.6% in terms of yield, and we had the taper, we had the taper tantrum, and we're not back down there yet, but we are at 1.8, and we've come down from around about 2.2%. So yes, certainly the bond, mar- the bond markets and the Fed funds markets aren't actually pricing in a rate hike this year. It's actually been pushed out. That's not to say it couldn't come back with a, you know, some, some positive data, but I just think that if you're looking for clues as to about what U.S. rate expectations are, look at the Treasury market. So, right, so, you, you, got, you, so you got your Canada. Sorry. Yes, I wanted to talk about U.S. dollar Canada, and then I'd like to talk about the uh, U.S. 30. Sure. Okay, which I think we a, can do. So this, is a daily, this is a daily chart for the CAD. Yeah, so this is running... Uh, opposite of uh, as oil prices have been going down, dollar CAD has been going up. So this is dollar strengthening, CAD weakening. But uh, what's interesting here is we are getting up to uh, about 120, and it started to roll back a little bit. I think you probably, you're you looking at a, uh, basically another pause here and a bigger uptrend. You come back down maybe around 118, maybe a little under to test this trend support line, and then you're still basically working higher, and you've got to work off this uh, overbought uh, uh, condition on the stochastic. So you might get some sideways trading in this 118 to 120 range, but you start seeing uh, crude breaking 45 and going 40, 35, and, and U.S. dollar CAD could still go higher. Um, can I talk to the U.S. 30, Michael, please? Sure. Yeah, let me just close that down and bring up the U.S. 30. One of the other things that's been happening is uh, is that all this is also playing out in the uh, in the wake of the end of the U.S.'s QE3 program, and it's something I had talked about in the past was that um, that QE programs, because they jam so much money in the system, have been known to uh, had been known to artificially inflate uh, stock prices and in commodity prices uh, in the past, and that w- once these programs ended, then you started to see things come back off. So. Uh, and, and basically, what I call a liquidity correction, where where some of this over, where markets had overshot, come back more to where they should be. Now, in the past, on stock markets, that had been a 10 to 15 percent correction, and um, and for commodities, uh, more than that. And it is possible that some of the oil price declines may be a function of this. It may be exacerbating it, or it may have been the part of the uh, issue. But then there's all these other things like the price war getting piled in and low demand getting piled in on top of a time when you were going to have a, a crunch anyways. But I want to just highlight the U.S. 30 here. There's a head and shoulders top forming. We had the one peak in early December, the uh, the head in late December, and now we've got a uh, another shoulder kicking in here in early January. Now, the overbought conditions have eased for a bit. Maybe this ends up becoming a sideways channel between, say, 17,100 and 18,100. But, uh, but it is looking a little bit weak here. We have we had a uh, an initial correction back in October. But uh, one of the outlook things I've been saying to people is this is the kind of year where you could see at different points in time you could have the S and P down 10 percent. You could see the S and P up 10 percent. I do think you're going to see more swings and uh, and more volatility. As we, uh, as as, finally, as as people are trying to figure out what to make out of all the uh, all the data and all the movement and all the changes and, and who's got credibility and who doesn't and, and what's happening with guidance and, and so on, there's a lot of uh, a lot of moving pieces, particularly over say the next month or two. Then uh, then ha- then once the dust settles, we may get a better idea of where things are heading. But uh, but for now, there's uh, probably going to see quite a bit of choppiness, I think. Speaking of credibility, uh, Citigroup have basically um, predicted that the FTSE 100 will go to 7,700 by the end of this year. I personally think they, they've probably been smoking something, but um, you know they said that the FTSE 100 would hit um, 7,000 at the end of last year. So, 
you know, what do they know? Eventually they could well be right. But, um, you know, for me, I think the only way that you're going to get the FTSE 100 hit 7,700 is if you get a significant turnaround in the commodity space. So you get a rebound in, pre in not only precious metals, but also copper and crude oil, simply because uh, the oil and gas sector and the uh, mining sector make up at least 35 to 40 percent of the FTSE 100. And at the moment, I think the more likelihood is the fact that we'll probably get a range trade between 6,200 and 6,900. But, you know, that's, just, uh, that's just, 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 just my opinion. But it's interesting to note what you said about the Dow. It's pretty similar in terms of the S&P as well. This sort Absolutely. of slight both consolidation between 1975 and, and obviously the high is just below 2,100. Yeah, that's a little bit weaker of a head and shoulders obviously, than the uh, than the Dow right now, but uh, mm. but it is the same kind of thing. You're, it, it's gotten stuck, and mm. uh, and the and the increasing volatility is is indicative that uh, that of of just more uncertainty out there as to where things are heading. And certainly today didn't uh, didn't do anything to to reduce any uncertainty. If anything, it's added to it. Yeah, well, let's look at the DAX because I think this is that's quite important because we're right on this previous peak. Let me just get rid of that. And let me draw a line through this peak here because, as I said in my note this morning, I suggested that we find a lot of good buyers um, in the DAX as a result of this move by the um, Swiss National Bank. And, you know, certainly we've seen a very, very strong rally in the DAX um, over the course of the last couple of hours. But we haven't as yet taken out those peaks that we saw in December around about 10,000. 900. We're still pretty much below them. So for me at the moment, I think we have to be very, very cautious about being overly bullish on the DAX while we are um, below um, these previous highs. Because you could actually argue if we fail here, this could actually potentially be a double top. Absolutely. It's an interesting one here, Michael, because if you that support line you had in, if you break out, you've got an ascending triangle breakout. But mm. if you fail, you've got a double top, and yeah. uh, and so you actually have two conflicting uh, indicators uh, going at each other here, and uh, and we'll see. So uh, so it's it's a real we're at a real turning point, and I think for this one it'll be again the ECB meeting. You've you've clearly pricing in here some serious stimulus, and if they don't come through and they disappoint, then then look out below. And if they if they actually manage to come through, then uh, then that can support a, a pretty nice breakout. So we are at a point where we could have a fairly significant move, but it's it's hard to read which way. It is, and I think well, one of the things that is um, there's, there's an awful lot of conflicting signals going on at the moment because we're starting to move into a world of negative interest rates. And obviously the first port call um, when you're searching for yield is essentially, um, and central bank policy is loose, is to, to move into stocks. But we're at record highs in the DAX. We're just off record highs in the S&P. And we're in an environment at the moment where growth is continuing to be very, very difficult to come about, you know, to come by. The World Bank yesterday cutting its growth forecast. Commodity prices since 2011 have been going lower. You know, so you've got all these correlations that used to work well in the past. They're no longer working, and it's very, very difficult to try and allocate capital in an environment such as the one that we've, we're operating in right now. Right, so we've got the DAX. It's interesting to note that the the the, the CAC 40 is um, well short of its previous highs in September of four and a half thousand, and you know and this is one of the things that bothers me a little bit with respect to some of these equity markets. They're performing they're performing completely differently. I mean, it's not surprising that the DAX is probably performing the best given the fact that Germany is the best economy. I think what is a surprise, I think, is the outperformance today of the Italian market. Um, but again, if you look at where the previous peaks are in June, we're still well below that. And for me, the trend still remains lower for Italian markets, despite the fact that we're rallying strongly today. So again, I think it's very, very difficult to um, you can you can you can take one of two schools of thought here. You can basically think, well, actually, Italian markets have underperformed relative to the DAX, and maybe the easy trade is to buy Italian stocks. But would you really want to take the risk with respect to you know what could happen next with respect to political instability? You know, it's a bit of a tough call. But you know, first and foremost, we're traders. You know, and we trade the price action. We we don't trade what could happen. We we react to what. 
um, does happen. Though I think any of us would have struggled to react to what the Swiss National Bank did today. But certainly there is very, very good support in the Italian 40, around about 17,640. Okay, let's have a quick look at dollar yen um, before we sign off. Gone over slightly, I think, over the course of the uh, the last few minutes. But certainly, the direction of travel here also seems to suggest that, despite the fact that you know the Japanese central bank wants the yen to remain fairly weak, I think the market's got a little bit of ahead of itself, and I think that the downside risk in dollar yen is greater than the upside risk. Everyone is calling the dollar higher. And as such, I think that's why I think it's a little bit dangerous to be overly long of it. Unless, of course, you're looking to short euro dollar, then it might be worth selling euro dollar on rallies and buying dollars against the euro. Yeah, and the yen's also been strengthening quite dramatically against the euro uh, lately as well. The euro's the one that's really been going off the table here. Yeah, yeah, and obviously I think that that also, you know, breeds into the narrative of, um, a weaker euro. Um, not only do the ECB want um, a lower euro dollar, they will also want a lower euro yen. And at the moment, it's a bit of a tug of war um, with respect to the central banks, with yeah. respect to euro yen. But this is actually quite interesting. We're actually testing support on the euro yen uh, at current levels um, at around about 135 and a half on the previous lows that we saw in 2014. So we're currently testing the 2014 lows on Euro-Yen. So we're at a quite a key support level at current levels. So it'll be interesting to see how the market reacts at current levels with respect to Euro-Yen. The 2014 lows, let me just draw them in. It's around about 134.15. But really, I think the key level is, is this upper line here because that's quite a long shadow on that candle. And it is a weekly chart. So, so for me, I think the key level is going to be um, currently where we are now, around about these series of lows here. We've got a low there in August, a low there in September, a couple of lows there in October. So we can more or less actually discount that low at 134.15. That was probably a whole load of stops getting triggered on the way down. The quickest way to mitigate that is to just do that. And that will actually give you a fair indication of where we need to close below for euro yen to actually accelerate an awful lot lower. So that's an interesting chart, certainly worth keeping an eye on over the course of the next few days. Okie doke. So if anyone's got, if no one's got any further questions, that's it for this month's um, analyst um, analyst update from myself and Colin. I'd like to thank you all for um, your presence and um, hopefully you'll join us again next month, I think on the 12th of February, where we'll uh, have a good old chin wag about um, whether or not um, everything that we've discussed has actually come to pass and you can hold us to account. But otherwise, thanks very much for listening, guys. We'll put it up on YouTube um, in the course of the next 24 hours if you want to listen to any of the points back. Thanks very much, Michael, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Right, I'm going to stop recording.